If you are tagged, then they will find you. And the exclusive first time on television, x-rays, photographs, and surgery to remove the implants. I have never seen anything such as this come out of anybody. Is this proof that aliens are among us? A fiery plane crash turns into a near-death experience. I saw a woman coming toward me dressed in white. Take a walk on the other side. This man is haunted by ghosts of the Civil War. Some of them literally do not know that they're dead. Is he a reincarnated soldier from the past? Two eyewitnesses share their true story of a phenomenal close encounter. It locked eyes with me and I felt like I just got pulled into it. Come face to face with the alien in the manhole. And the psychic detectives try to crack a tragic case of murder. I feel like he takes her somewhere there where there's a stand of evergreen trees. On the paranormal borderline. Hello, I'm Jonathan Frakes. Imagine waking up one morning and feeling something strange beneath your skin. It is not human. It is not organic. It is not even of this world. It is an implant inserted by aliens who abducted you. Impossible? You may think so now, but you're in no position to judge until you watch this story. That they just took this long needle type thing and just put it right up my nose. When you experience an implant, it feels as if something is being put in your body, and it was very painful. And uh, I'd have to say it's probably between my eyes, up inside my brain. And I cried and I screamed and I got very scared because I didn't know what was going on. These people are living with fear. They believe that they have experienced one of the most terrifying things imaginable. A close encounter of the worst kind. Alien implants. Barbara Dobrin is a PhD psychotherapist. She provides therapy and counseling for the victims of alien abduction. The researchers that are studying these phenomena uh, say that uh, there are alien implants. They are tracking us. If you are tagged, then they will find you. It doesn't matter where you go. You can go anywhere you want to. But the world is round. You cannot hide. This woman claims that she has been abducted and implanted to protect her privacy. She doesn't want her name used. These beings tell you, just you're going to forget all of this. You're not going to remember anything. Don't tell anyone. So then that leads me to believe, okay, I've been raped. When you are raped, you can go to the police station and say, gee, I've been raped. What are you going to do about it? Well, you look at mug shots. I don't think they're ready for these mug shots. The year was 1992, and she was riding home with a friend. This was a cold November night. We both noticed a large light in the sky. At that point, the light descended at a rapid pace. It just dropped from the sky. The car just illuminated, and I grabbed my friend's hand, and I said, oh my God, not again. I knew that feeling, I knew that sense of fear. They had left me alone for three or four years, but they were back. Private investigator Don Arterburn has looked into some of the cases involving alien implants. Initially a skeptic, his research has led him to believe that it's possible these people are telling the truth. I got involved with this because I had clients who were having unusual occurrences happen to them. There are some really unusual things. As an investigator, what really keeps me going on it is, this is it's like the most interesting puzzle I've ever run across. It could mean that there's something great going on out there and I'd like to know what it is. After the incident on the road, she found unexplained marks on her hand that she believes are proof of implantation. These are her photographs. My hand was inflamed with a uh, triangle shape just below my first knuckle. The triangle on the hand is like an identification for them. Somehow, maybe it's a tissue sample, I don't know, this, there's tissue missing from my hand. It's indented, you can feel this, it's obvious. For abduction victims, the implant experience can be extremely traumatic. These memories made me almost go insane. It led me to a hypnotherapist, and she helped me in retrieving the whole picture. It sounds very much like 
when an animal gets tagged in the sea or the wild, uh, that that's what's happening to us also. And there have been many thousands of people coming forward that say they've been implanted. Why is implantation occurring? Some researchers speculate that alien beings are involved in the creation of a half-human, half-alien species. I think what they want from me is to take care of the hybrid children. Because every time I'm taken, I take care of their children. They want me to hold their children. They want me to kiss them and love them and to show them emotion. They don't understand that because when you're doing that, they study you very closely. They aren't very nice. They're not very friendly. They take what they want and then they're done with you. There are doctors who take it seriously, but they don't want to go public on it. There are surgeons around that will do these implant removals. These uh, people who've been abducted will be treated, taken care of. If there were implants beneath her skin, she wanted them out. This doctor put together the surgical team that ended up removing identical implants from two different people. What we saw when we removed the objects is uh, quite different than anything that I had ever seen before. The one that was placed in my ear, it was um, maybe six or eight inches long. It was a cylinder type thing. It was like a drill. And it was very painful. You're looking at the actual x-rays from the operation, seen for the first time on television. This is a foreign body at the level of the base of the second metacarpal bone. This is the uh, object that we are going to remove. Later in this program, we'll take you inside the operating room to remove the so-called alien implants. The exclusive story from the actual eyewitnesses. We'll be right back. Coming up next, meet a woman who's had a near-death experience. I remember seeing my hands on fire. Did she get a startling glimpse of her own future? Then, a terrifying close encounter with an alien creature. I look over at Lori, and her eyes are like saucers. They're huge. And later, Virginia police turn to our psychic detectives for help in catching a killer. And the dramatic findings of our alien implant surgery. All three objects glowed a phosphorescent green. The paranormal borderline will return. The night before a plane trip, Rennell Wallace had a dream. In her dream, the plane piloted by her husband, Terry, crashed. She took the flight anyway. There was a, just a gut-wrenching cold chill that just went through every corner of my body. And I started screaming, you know that dream I had last night, Terry? I just have a feeling about this. What would you do if you had a dream that told you you were in danger? And a strange little voice told you you could avoid it. Would you listen? For Terry and Rennell Wallace, it should have been an easy flight from one small airport in Utah to another. But Rennell's vision from the night before began coming true in every detail. The visibility started shrinking. The snow started coming down and forcing me lower and lower and lower. By the time Terry realized they were in trouble, there wasn't a safe way out. And then, through the clouds, they spotted a mountain. He started pulling up on the steering column and we started a real steep ascent. And as we did, it was, I just started screaming. This is just like glasses on the roller coaster. Mwah! And all of a sudden I heard this clunk, clunk, clunk as the, as the propeller hit a tree. And then it started skidding into the, to the ground. And, and then I knew I was going to get smashed. Parts of the plane started to fly up along the side and the sparks started to fly up underneath the cockpit. It came to a dead halt, and there was not a scratch or bruise on either one of us. And I was shocked. Brunel kicked open the door. An explosion blew out the roof of the cockpit and her with it. I remember seeing parts of my coat and flames falling off and dripping down onto my pants and onto the ground. I remember seeing my hands on fire. Terry escaped with minor injuries, but Brunel's wounds were killing her with burns over 75% of her body. Her face was burned beyond recognition. As EMTs rushed to a hospital, she moved closer and closer to death. And I said, somebody please, I can't breathe. And the male nurse bent down to my ear and he said, stop trying, we'll do all the work for you. And at that moment, I remember everything got very black. And then it became clearer and clearer. And as I looked around, I realized I was standing up in the ambulance. Technically, Brunel died that day. 
most people do not know that they're dead. Their consciousness is fully conscious of what's going on, and yet there they are, the shell of who they thought they were, lying there being pronounced dead. Brunel was having a near-death experience. And then in the distance, I saw a woman coming toward me dressed in white. And she moved very quickly and stood in front of me. And when she stopped, she smiled. And she called me out by name. And my first thought was, do you know me? And she answered back, Rennell, it's Grandma. Rennell recognized the woman as her late grandmother at about age 25. And she had a message for Rennell. She told her to conquer fear and return to life in the physical world. And that I would need to build the strength to stay strong to overcome the ordeals ahead of me. And that I needed to, to come to learn and appreciate the great love and the power within me. Then her grandmother showed Rennell her physical body. And I was in there by myself. And the room was very dark and it was very cold. My first thought was, that's not me. Because it was so ugly. Brunel looked at her tortured body and told her grandmother there was no way she could return. And she said, look. And in the path I saw a young man coming. And he says, Mom, what are you doing here? Brunel saw that this was her son, a son yet unborn. His name was Nathaniel. And I went and put my arms around him. And I said, Nathaniel. He says, Mom, you have to go back. He says, I need you, Mom. He says, there's so much I have to do, and I can't do it without you. Finally, Rennell decided to return. She regained consciousness in a Salt Lake City burn center and was released six weeks later. But her biggest test was to come. Rennell arrived home physically intact, but far from being healed. She wore a tight mask to keep scar tissue from spreading on her face. Fire was her worst nightmare. It literally terrorized me. Every time I turned the stove on, I would jump a mile high. Less than two months after returning home from the hospital, Brunel and Terry were up before dawn to go to another surgical appointment. And I saw these flames coming out of the neighbor's house. And that's when I heard a voice. And uh, that voice was so clear. I went over and I looked at the window and I saw the flame from the roof and it said, get over there, they're asleep. Her grandmother's message about conquering her fears flashed through her mind. As Terry called 911, Rennell ran to help. And I started pounding on the window and pounding on the door and there was no answer. I ran back to the garage and the door was flipping up and down from the electrical switch and I um, tried to break between the two cars to get in and that's when the garage door shut behind me and I was trapped inside the garage. And it was filling up real rapidly with black thick smoke. And I was choking. But uh, I started screaming, if, you're, if anyone's in there, please get out, get out, your house is on fire. Finally, I heard this loud screeching sound of a woman's voice screaming at the top of her lungs. I said, if you're okay, get out, your house is on fire. Rennell managed to kick open the garage door and met the woman in front. There were two children asleep inside and they ran in to save them. I said, stay underneath the smoke, stay underneath the smoke. She was gone in a second, she came back. The house was a total loss, but everyone survived. And she started to say, thank you, thank you. And I started screaming, thank you, thank you. This is why are you thanking me? And I said, you'll never understand. You'll never understand. Brunel's courage won national attention and presidential recognition. And here I was faced with something that I thought would paralyze the rest of my life, but it was the greatest blessing of my life because it has helped me to conquer the greatest fears that I have. Brunel's greatest blessing was still to come. Although doctors told her it would not be possible, eight years after the plane crash, Brunel gave birth to a son. She believes it is the boy she met in her near-death experience. She named him Nathaniel. Oh, my big guy. I love you. Every once in a while I'll go, Nathaniel, 
I'll just think, will he respond? Will he look at me in that same look that I saw on the other side? And doggone it, if it once in a while he doesn't turn around and I see that little bit of the spark in his eye. And I'll go, Nathaniel, it's you. And he'll come and put his arms around me and say, get me. <laughs> and it's him. Above all, Rennell has learned to listen to that gentle voice from beyond. It helped me to learn to be more confident of um, listening to the burning within, to listen to the heart. If it hadn't been for that voice, I would have never gone into that fire. After writing a book and lecturing on the subject of conquering fear, Rennell decided to confront the biggest fear she has left, flying. She recently joined Terry for their first flight together since the crash. I'm more focused on, really, there's no fear that I can't conquer. I've gotten to the point that, uh, you know, everything is possible. You just have to believe. Everything is possible. Everything. A final footnote to this story. Now when Rennell Wallace gets a warning in her dreams, she listens. Coming up next, meet a man being hunted by ghosts of the Civil War. And they're beckoning to me to come with him. Then, an alien encounter unlike any other. And as soon as I was looking into its eyes, it was like I was getting information. Later, our psychic detectives put police on the trail of a murderer. He does stalk people, he does watch women. And the unearthly conclusion to the alien implant surgery. I remember being laid on a table the paranormal borderline will return. And with a normal job, even had a normal hobby, an interest in history. But then it became more than a hobby, more than an obsession. It became his whole life. And as it turns out, his past life. I was up on uh, one part of the battlefield, looking down into a part where some of the Confederate soldiers came up. So just kidding around, I raised an imaginary musket, and I pretend I cocked it back. I said, get ready, boys, here they come. And as soon as I said that, there was two large volleys of gunfire. Where did it come from? I mean, something like that, there had to be about 100 men behind us. We turned, I mean, there was nobody there. It was, it was just strange. Eight years ago, Michael Flood became fascinated with the Civil War. He pursued every opportunity to study and reenact its battles. We live the life of a soldier uh, as authentic as we can. Uh, we, we get dirty, we uh, sleep in the clean clothes all weekend, working them, fighting them, sleeping them, just like they did. But his obsession with the war started to take over his life. Now Michael's not sure whether he's the one pursuing the Civil War or whether it's pursuing him. And the more he learns about the war, the more he sees its ghosts. They can find you wherever you are and seek you out. Michael is a northerner, formerly an officer with the New York Department of Corrections. What began as a hobby was turning into a way of life. Soon, he was devoting all his time to the conflict, eating, sleeping, and thinking as a soldier battling for the Union. We're on a serious mission. We're on a mission of death. We're out there to kill the enemy or the enemy was going to kill us. But Michael was soon to learn that he was fighting for the wrong side. He found out at Gettysburg, while camped near the battlefield. The cold weather forced him to sleep in his car. Suddenly, he got an unexpected visit from a Confederate soldier who had been dead for over 130 years. I woke up and looked out the window and saw soldier on horseback riding by in the car and he stopped and he looked towards the direction of Gettysburg in his saddle like opened the car door when the dome light came on the man vanished for Michael this was a clear call to action now he knew his destiny lay in the past as a confederate soldier he wasn't alone many people claimed to see civil war ghosts he contacted Nanette Morrison a Virginia author who has written two books on the subject I was just beginning research on the two books. Once I assured him that there were many other people that had had similar 
and more startling experiences, then he was a lot more comfortable with it as far as giving a lot more details. She uses regression techniques like hypnosis to help people explore their past lives. Her work with Michael led him to believe he had been in the war. Thank you, Calvary out there. There's groups of them, they're out patrolling. I'm so I'm afraid I want to be spotted. And this was a lifetime that he had 130 years ago. And he played a very important role during the Civil War. This past life became increasingly important to Michael. He could no longer live in the North or fight for the Union side. Finally, Michael and his girlfriend moved to Richmond, Virginia, capital of the old Confederacy, where he enlisted in a rebel regiment. I don't know if I'll ever find out the real reason why I came down here. I just know I'm comfortable down here. I, I like it down here. I have no desire ever to move back up north. A short while after answering the call south, he received another invitation. I heard uh, a creak in the hallway. It sounded like somebody walking out there. This time he was in bed. It was three in the morning. And I saw two figures appear in the doorway of the bedroom. And I just kind of looked and right away I recognized they were soldiers. They were beckoning to me to come with them. They told me to uh, come with them. They needed me to defend Richmond. And now I said, well, man, this is crazy. He was terrified. Fighting reenactments was one thing, but for these ghosts, there was a real war going on. And I kind of did the best thing I could do. I turned over and pulled the covers over my head and told him to go away. Why do they appear to Michael? Morrison believes that the battlefield entities are generally attracted to reenactors. They feel an affinity for the people that are still living in physical bodies. More than 600,000 lives were lost in the war. Every one an American tragedy. They were people who were killed somewhat unexpectedly. Uh, a lot of the people were very young and they were not emotionally prepared to die. It's like rewinding a tape and showing it again. It's constantly the same battles are caught in time forever. I don't think it's ever going to stop. There'll be a tape that'll never end. Some of them literally do not know that they're dead. But it's Michael who is caught in the middle. His passion for the Confederacy calls him to the battlefield in the daylight. And the ghosts of the rebel army come calling at night. I guess I have a curiosity to try to find the truth. Find out why this is happening. What do they want? Why do they keep appearing? And it's just going to be an answer. And I think uh, that's the only thing that's keeping me on track. Maybe I might not like the answer I find. But I'll have to worry about that when I get to it. paths to our destiny are not always the ones we would expect. Michael Flood managed to find his in the past when he crossed the paranormal borderline. Later in the show, for the first time on television, the exclusive alien implant photographs and surgery. But first, there's a signpost up ahead. Watch your step for the alien in the manhole. UFOs seem to have a nasty habit of showing up in remote, sparsely inhabited regions. Not in our next story, which takes place near Denver, Colorado. This time, there were witnesses. Many witnesses who saw it flash across the sky, and one woman who says she came face to face with the alien pilot. It was nothing like I've ever seen in the sky. It was certainly not an aircraft, a weather balloon, anything like that. It flashed this very bright blue, like a blue, blue sky. The only thing I could relate to was when I was in elementary school and they had films on nuclear attacks. On a cold November night, Lori witnessed an incident in the sky above Denver, Colorado. That night would set her on a quest for answers that has not been resolved to this day. It began when she was out driving with a friend. A detective in a Denver area police department. Fearing repercussions from his superiors, he asked us to conceal his identity and disguise his voice. And all of a sudden, the, the sky started gradually getting bluer and bluer and bluer, kind of in a crescendo action. And um, there's this huge 
ball of color, for lack of a better term, a meteor coming across the sky. I didn't know if it was, uh, you know, some spacecraft or a nuclear attack. Those were the two things that were really going through my mind. This is the big day, and and uh, we've been attacked by some nuclear thing. You know? What was it that Lori and her friend had seen? The next day, the local press and hundreds of witnesses were buzzing with the news. About an hour's drive south of Denver is the Black Forest Observatory. We asked Paul Van Slyke, director of the observatory, about the UFO. We got probably 25 to 30 calls uh, within a 24-hour period after the incident. And it went from um, right over the top of the springs and fragmented, disintegrated, and broke up before it hit the ground. Uh, out east of Colorado Springs. Though Van Slyke thought the object may have been a meteor, the volume of calls and the estimated size of the fireball intrigued him. He decided to conduct an aerial search of the area where the object was supposed to have fallen. And uh, we circled around there in the area we thought it came down in for many hours and didn't find anything that looked like anything that was different from the normal terrain on the ground. The next day at work, Lori couldn't stop thinking about what she'd seen the night before. The official explanation that it was a meteor didn't seem right. For Lori, it was the ultimate mystery, and she couldn't rest until she knew the truth. That night, she enlisted her friend's help and went out to investigate. They traveled to a point where they could see the entire city of Denver and the vast sky above. We got in my car and we drove down to Daniels Park Road. We drove on that for a while and we got to a point where there was a perfect view of the entire city. It was about 10.30, 10.35 and, and Laurie says, I don't think we're going to see anything. Why don't we we'll just go home? Following an overpowering instinct, the couple continued down the road. It led to an unfamiliar area, still under construction. And I noticed something black that moved up ahead in the middle of the street. And it appeared to be blowing up from some kind of a wind, but it wasn't like traveling down the street. It was just like it was nailed on the base and the top maybe was, was blowing up. And I realized it was a manhole cover. And that it was being supported by the hugest head I had ever seen in my life. And I look over at Lori, and her eyes are like saucers. They're huge, and she's just locked on this thing. And she's not saying anything. Her mouth is wide open. It locked eyes with me, and I felt like I just got pulled into it. It had enormous, deep, black eyes. And as soon as I was looking into its eyes, it was like I was getting information, lots and lots of information. And it wasn't like it was telling me something. It was like it was confirming something that I somehow already knew. Knowledge I had in my possession, and it was pretty overwhelming. In, in my line of work, proof beyond a reasonable doubt is pretty much the name of the game. And I was trying to, to justify some kid playing some kind of a hoax or a prank and having this manhole cover on his head, and that's just physically impossible. I didn't see any arms supporting it or anything like that. It was at that time I'd know I'd, I had seen an alien. Is it possible they saw an extraterrestrial that night? Lori remains convinced she did. Something inside her will not let the incident simply fade away, and science does not completely discount her story either. You've got 200 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy alone. So what are the odds that there's another planet like Earth up there, 100%. For now, Lori must be satisfied with more questions than answers. But whatever drove her to investigate the strange crash makes her believe there's no rational explanation for what she saw. I keep trying to convince myself that it, it's all just some bizarre thing that happened and that maybe somehow it can be explained away. I don't think I've got myself anywhere close to convinced about that. Another of the thousands of alien encounter stories. And perhaps there is the occasional alien in the Denver sewer system. But I'm still waiting for the one encounter that can prove all the others are real.
Coming up next, our psychics try to solve a young girl's murder. I have the feeling that she had encountered him twice before and that he had frightened her both times. Then, startling evidence of actual alien implants. I have never seen anything such as this come out of anybody. The paranormal borderline will return. It's evil Wednesday on UBN. We're all gonna die. First on the second off, a terrorist group takes an entire police precinct hostage. We can have a blood bath on our hands. And only one cop can stop them. A cop who uses all five senses like weapons. Then on Swift Justice, a rock star turned stalker needs a swift lesson in manners. What if he smell? New UPN night, new UPN heroes, non-stop UPN action. Swift Justice after the second off. Two brand new episodes tomorrow on UPN. Pass the ball. I got to take you higher. You land the ball. I got to take you higher now. Bang. Jam the ball. Shoot the ball. Thursday night, your Cleveland Cavs are out west for a matchup with the Clippers. Tip off is at 10:30, and it's here on Channel 43. Hey, Hey, do you know what day it is? Here's a hint. <laughs> it's the first of the month. It's Jet Dry Day. Come on. Give me some more Jet Dry. I'm running on fumes here. Is one bottle a month too much to ask? Oh, you remembered. <laughs> Sweet nectar. <laughs> Look at that. Another sparkling, gleaming load. Like it's all been buffed by hand with a soft cloth. Jet Dry. On the first of every month, your dishwasher was designed for it. With your period, it's always something. If it's not major cramps, it's headaches, backaches, big-time bloating, or that dreaded irritability factor. Good thing Pamperin has three ingredients to relieve them all. Try Pamperin. Way beyond pain relief, period relief. When pain strikes, go for the Flexol and get going again. In clinical tests, people suffering from pain confirmed that aloe vera-based Flexol penetrates deep to bring fast-acting, long-lasting relief. Flexol. Last year, over a million people purchased new cars without relying on dealers. Subcompacts, luxury cars, vans, and pickups, all at an average of $1,800 below sticker in Cleveland. Car buyers are turning to A.H. Auto & Truck Consultants. A.H. Auto & Truck Consultants save you time, money, and help find the make, model, color, and accessories you want. A.H. will get you the best interest rates, full factory warranty, and the best... Tonight, the psychic detectives are taking on a really tough case that has baffled police for over five years. A young girl was killed, and the murderer is still free. Yolanda Gaskins has more. Thanks, Jonathan. Early one morning in Virginia Beach, Virginia, a 17-year-old high school student left home to help a neighbor do some house cleaning. The next morning, Joan Chopal's body was found. She had been murdered. It was kind of rough. You know, to find out when two detectives walk in the house and say, we found your daughter dead. Uh, my wife took the worst. I haven't accepted it, so it's kind of hard. Joan, from the very beginning, was, was a really special child. She seemed destined to be the big sister of, of our family. The show Paul's nightmare began with a homeless man searching for food. Joan's body was found in a dumpster. The case is at a dead end at this point. Virginia Beach, the homicides that we have, we've solved nearly 100% of our cases in the past three years. This case is one of the more difficult ones because of the minimal amount of evidence that we have available. Joan would have been 23 now and would have been in a very special time of her life. And there is someone out there who knows what happened to Joan. Before we begin, I have to stress that the information that you've just viewed has not been seen by the psychics. The psychic detectives are Nancy Meyer, Kathleen Ray, and Greta Alexander. Also with us in studio are Detective Alan Ball of the Virginia Beach Police and the victim's parents, Wayne and Joan Chopal. Let's begin. I feel like that this, uh, uh, the perpetrator had seen her several times. 
And I think that he had kind of tried to make up to her. She was afraid because I found that my hand was just trembling when I, when I first started working this, and I'm just shaking. The next thing that I find is, I find that he like cut her off. I have her, and I'm saying, uh, but, but you don't understand, I just, I just want to talk to you. Come on, come on, come on. You know, pulling her to, to come with him. is near a food store, a big food store. And it was the kind of food store that had, um, you know, like, it sold cards and there's a pharmacy either in the same strip or within the store as well. And I think the smelling chemicals that smell sort of like dry cleaning. Nancy mentioned the shopping center. Did that ring true? Yes. Uh, actually, when you talked about a, a larger grocery store, uh, the victim's uh, body was found behind a large commercial mm -hmm. food store mm -hmm. um, and if I remember correctly the food store does have a drug store and yes it does and, and there is a dry cleaner mm -hmm. he drives a beat-up looking truck that's got uh, probably originally was like gray and white colors on it I have the feeling that she had encountered him twice before and that he had frightened her both times that he had approached her seemingly to ask directions or help in some way but she had felt extremely nervous just being around him. I feel like he takes her somewhere there where there's a stand of evergreen trees. Actually, discussing uh, evergreen trees, there's mm -hmm. a piece of evidence that no one knows about but the detectives handling the case, and it's, it's something I really don't want to bring yeah. out. Uh, and that's that it's really shocking. It'd fit. His clothing is... Um, it looks like there's paint on it, as if he may be involved in painting somehow. And I have the feeling that he does odd jobs in different places. He also uses that as a cover, because he does stalk people, he does watch women. Um, you know, the alcohol and drugs that he's been involved in, he looks older than his actual age is. As she was talking, you were nodding and writing. Is there something that sounds familiar in yes, the investigation? Actually, I'm looking at um, one individual who uh, is somewhat a contractor, uh, does drive an older, at the time, drove an, an older model vehicle. Um, a lot of things sounded familiar. I was actually getting goosebumps going there. <laughs> one thing that was hit on um, pretty hard was the individual I'm looking at also has, is an alcoholic. What came flying into my mind was the impression of one of those carpenter's aprons, and there's blood spatter down one side of yeah, one of them. And it looks like paint, but it's actually blood. And it's her blood. It's and with the DNA stuff, that would be real helpful yeah, if you can find it. He has three or four of them. Okay. And it's one that he keeps set aside, but he still uses it. That's a picture of a guy you guys described as the guy I'm looking at. Do you think uh, this individual will talk to the police once he's he's picked up? Is he? Can you tell if he's willing? You have to, to make him feel like you're sorry for him. Uh, let us help you. It's going to be, yeah, we know you've had a hard time. You're going to have to give him that kind of thing to get him to open up. The psychics in this session continue to provide leads on the main suspect in the killing. Back in Virginia Beach, Detective Ball used that information to confront the prime suspect face to face. He owned a leather tool belt. He said that he did. He said he kept it in the van. And I have photographs of the van with the paint inside, which confirms what they said. Following up on that interview, Detective Ball learned from a new witness that Joan was at the suspect's home on the last night of her life. Ironically, the suspect now lies in a hospital terminally ill. The detective hopes for a deathbed confession. The suspect did confirm things that the psych detectives have mentioned. Because of the information received by the psych detectives, this investigation is still targeted as, at this individual as remain suspect. There may never be a conviction in this case, but the police, the parents, and the psychics are now certain who the killer is. I'm sure that the psychics information was sufficient to, to lead the police to the person that's responsible for my daughter's death. 
We'll be back in a moment. Coming up next, extraordinary evidence of alien implants. I was absolutely frightened. I knew exactly what it was. Will this abductee's life ever be the same again? I am afraid. I'm afraid for my family. Hear this remarkable story. It's not people's imaginations. It's just not mass hallucination. I do believe there's definitely something going on out there. The Paranormal Borderline will return. Wendy's new country French chicken tastes so delicious. Bonjour, Dave. Bonjour. It has everyone speaking French. Could it be Wendy's country French roll? Comment ça va, Dave? Bien. The Swiss, topped with Dave's tangy Dijon sauce. Bonjour, Dave. Bonjour. Or Wendy's whole breast fillet. Merci. Whatever. It's a sandwich so delicious, only Dave could have made it. Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. Bonjour, amaze me. You've got to be stopped. Come try Wendy's new country French chicken. After driving through Botswana's never-ending supply of mud, we came upon the largest animal of the land, the African elephant. These massive creatures can plow over trees with the butt of their heads, and spectators best stand clear, for they can pick up objects weighing nearly two tons. The preceding has been brought to you by the powerful all-new Nissan Pathfinder, now with 20% more cargo room to help you pull big things around. Oh, the places Cool Whip can go. With less than two grams of fat per serving, take an everyday something and send it to magical new heights. Cool Whip. Oh, the possibilities. If more top mechanics use one motor oil over any other brand in their own cars and trucks, maybe it's time you changed your oil. Valvoline. The number one choice of America's top mechanics. We'll be back in a moment. I just wasn't satisfied with my headache medicine. And my doctor told me about Arutus. Of all the prescription pain medicines, 82% of doctors surveyed have prescribed Arutus. And now it's available in a non-prescription strain. Potent new Arutus KT. Just 25 milligrams is as effective as 400 milligrams of Motrin IV, 440 of Aleve, or 1,000 milligrams of extra strength Tylenol. Now for headaches. I've got a Rudis K2. It's Earl Jones. That's what you call a, a long story. I, I like to kind of hear it again myself. In a motion picture that gives everyone with nothing in common. <laughs> you need to know your history, son. Something to share. It's a family thing. A family thing. Rated PG-13. Starts Friday, March 29th at theaters everywhere. How do you get clean and fresh? Jurgen's body shampoo. I get so much lather. I mean, you really, really can feel the clean. And it rinses clean without soap foam. Totally refreshing. How refreshing is it? You feel fresh. You come out with some bounce in your step. This freshness is fabulous. Sounds like you love the clean, fresh feeling. Showers will never be the same. I just feel incredibly clean. I'm never going to let you go. Jurgen's body shampoo. Now in a new moisturizing formula. Another beautiful idea from today's Jurgen's. We all watch television. Well, now we may be watching some of our favorite shows disappear because some members of Congress want to tax local TV broadcasters billions of dollars in order to balance the budget. A tax that could mean you'll end up either paying a lot more to watch your favorite shows or worse still, see them disappear altogether. Either way, we all lose. Call toll-free and tell Congress to vote against the TV tax. Call now while you still can. Now this from the Fun Network. Due to the overwhelming fun of Woody's Playhouse, all adventures will be ongoing seven days a week at Woody's Playhouse in Chabrita Falls, just off Route 422. Next at 10, a man who beheaded his three children may soon be free to walk the streets. Peepholes found in a restroom in downtown Cleveland have women in an uproar. Then, a topless bar is shut down for going too far. And it must be spring, just look at all those potholes. Good evening, I'm Ramona Robinson. Do you know how to survive a tornado? Meteorologist Kerry Coleman has information you need. Recently, he operated on two people and removed three objects. Here's the story of that operation. I must warn you, this is not for the squeamish. Some of the footage is quite graphic. The uh, patient uh, was uh, prepped in the operating room and underwent uh, a hypno-anesthesia. 
I was absolutely frightened. I knew exactly what it was. I am afraid. I'm afraid for my family. So there are very few friends that I have told about the experience, and the ones that I have told, they don't come around anymore. This woman is living on the edge of a nightmare. She believes she is a victim of alien abduction and implantation. It's just uh, astounding to me that uh, we can find foreign objects uh, in the body, a material that could uh, possibly be extraterrestrial origin. This doctor was part of a medical team that removed identical implants from a man's hand and a woman's toe. This first ever surgical procedure suggests that implants are not just imaginary, but may be real. Late one night, she began her terrifying journey. I remember being laid on a table and then being laid down in the air with no table underneath me. They were doing something to my ear. My brain was jammed and I couldn't. I couldn't function. I woke up Sunday morning with blood on my pillow. And I, as I went into the bathroom, I flipped on the light, and there was blood all over my face and my cheek up to my ear. She is just one of many people experiencing this strange phenomenon. They have suffered alone without any possibility of proof. But that might be about to change. You know, there comes a time when you really have to face it. And the time is coming near, and we're close to that point. We may have some physical evidence here for the first time that was well documented. This man was the lead surgeon on this extraordinary operation. He has chosen to protect his identity and that of the other doctors involved in this story. We were extremely interested in uh, documenting the procedure with uh, all available means. We used video, still photography, over the next several hours, surgeons operated on two separate patients and removed three different metallic objects. The initial incision was made uh, to recover the largest of the foreign objects. And upon removal, the uh, patient uh, literally came up off the table. This was most unusual, the only possible way that this could happen is that the object uh, must have been in some direct connection with a nerve. Perhaps the strangest realization came as the implants were removed. Registered nurse Mike Evans assisted in the operating room. What makes me think that this is extraterrestrial is the fact that I have never seen anything such as this come out of anybody. I got it. Yeah, that's it. Triangular. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. These objects were encased in a very dense, dark gray cocoon. And it was so dense that uh, when I tried to remove this cocoon to uh, look at the uh, metal inside, I could not cut through it with a surgical blade. It's just like that. Very similar. It's the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Amazingly, the implants were identical although they were removed from two people that had never met before. The only thing the patients had in common were similar detailed stories of abduction. While a complete forensic analysis of the objects is still pending, we asked physician Dr. Howard Mandel to examine the partial pathology report. The question I would ask is, how many people have foreign bodies in this whole United States that they've had from something being thrown into, in, into their skin? All three objects glowed a phosphorescent green. This happens to be the same green that's reported in the abduction literature that has been seen on the extremities and fingertips of alleged abductees. I think it has some frightening uh, aspects to it. How would an identical object get in a man and get in a woman? Different areas, different times. The odds of that are so extraordinary. It's not people's imaginations, it's just not mass hallucination. I do believe there's definitely something going on out there. Are implants real? The controversy continues as the questions remain unanswered. The implant victims look with hope to the future while they do their best to cope with the present. There's no way they're going to take my sanity. So you just learn to deal with it. You develop 
little little things in your life that that are ordinary and every day that you can always rely on like dirty clothes <laughs> they're always there thank you for joining us on tonight's journey across the paranormal borderline we'll bring you more stories next time all you have to bring is an open mind i'm jonathan frakes good night if you would like to contact us at the paranormal borderline or if you have a story photographs or videotape evidence of a paranormal nature please call 1-800-UNKNOWN that's 1-800-865-6696 Tuesday Games Terror From a haunting search for a missing woman To chilling alien mutilations To a life or death battle beyond the grave The Paranormal Borderline A brand new episode next Tuesday on UPN